So uh, a little bit of background of how I got involved in secondary suites in Calgary. Um, it is actually very interesting that somebody from Calgary would get up and be speaking about secondary suites and making them a reality, given the, uh, you know, the discourse that happens at, uh, at Council every now and again, uh, like once a month, um, and, every, and, and the news articles that, that, that you see. But uh, really, within, within all of that context, we're still able to do a lot of, uh, a lot of innovative things to encourage suites. But um, what, the reason that I ended up involved in secondary suites is, so I'm a planner by education, I like to consider myself a recovering planner. I ended up going to building regulations for uh, five or six years uh, at the request of the, uh, of the manager and director because building regulations um, officials are really good at a lot of things, but writing council reports is not one of them. So they did a pilot in 2010, uh, like an enforcement pilot, um, to really kind of see what, what were some of the safety issues in secondary suites and, uh, and during the writing of the report, uh, it started to uh, kind of meander a little bit, so I got called in to, uh, to help out with the, uh, the writing of the report, and now, six years later, um, I seem to, uh, I can't shake these things, right? It's like, uh, it's like a bad smell. So uh, that's how I got involved with, uh, with secondary suites, and I want to talk to you a little bit about what we can do within the context that you, that you see and hear um, if you're from Calgary. Uh, or if you read the papers um, within the context of uh, what's happening in the, the political reality. So there's a really interesting history as well with, with Calgary. I call it Calgary's conundrum because I like alliteration, but uh, there's, a, there's a really interesting case that happened in, in 1969 that uh, has really um, helped shape um, our, uh, our land use reality when it comes to not just secondary suites, but a lot of different uses. Uh, so some of our present day challenges, and then our incentives. What we've done, uh, again, within, within the political context, uh, what we've done to incent uh, the creation of more legal and safe suites. Um, we're not really in the game of, of guessing how many illegal suites there are, but uh, CMHC used to be, and uh, they estimate somewhere in the 16,000 range. We think that's terribly low, uh, but uh, for sure there's thousands. I, I think the answer is actually lots. There's lots and lots of illegal secondary suites, what can we do uh, to improve that scenario? Obviously, um, our pilot from 2010, or the building regulations pilot from 2010, uh, looked at a, a relatively small sample size of suites, 50 of them, um, and what we found were some of the safety issues were uh, rather extreme, um, and probably most uh, concerning for, for us was that the owners really didn't even know what we were talking about when it came to safety provisions of, uh, of secondary suites. And, uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of uh, concerns when somebody wants to bring forward a, an existing illegal suite and legalize it. So just for clarity, uh, secondary suite in the, uh, in the Calgary context is contained within a house. So that's your basement suite, or it, can be, it doesn't have to be in the basement. It's not a garage suite. Uh, that we just call a, a backyard suite. And it's, it's not actually a, a duplex. So the up-down model, that's, that's a, a code terminology as well. It's the exact replica. It's, it's rather an apartment standard. So a duplex is not a secondary suite. Um, so a secondary suite is a, a, a defined term, uh, which we'll get into a little bit. Also legal categories. So we've got uh, legal, constructed with permits, illegal, constructed without permits, and then we've got the non-conforming, uh, legal non-conforming. So they were built with permits, but something happened over time to cause them to be legal but non-conforming. So uh, a great example in, uh, in the Calgary context is we've got the Lilydale chicken uh, plant in, uh, in, inside the city that has lost its, its, its uh, they can't expand it, right? So they're still legal, they're allowed to be there, they were there before the community, the community would love to see them leave, uh, but as long as they continue to operate, then they can stay. So similar analogy uh, for secondary suites, if they were built with a permit and then the land use changed to not allow them anymore, they're allowed to be there, uh, but they can't actually expand the use and that causes a lot of challenges in terms of what do we do for, uh, for encouraging suites to come forward. And the next slide coming up, we're, I'm gonna talk about uh, that, that uh, legal case from 1969. So anything uh, pre-1970 in the Calgary context is very 
uh, unique in, in Alberta. So pre-1970, there was a, sorry, in 1969, there was a, an abattoir application um, that was refused. They challenged that and took it to the court of uh, the, the, the Alberta Appeal Court, Court of Appeal, sorry. Um, they challenged not just the decision, but they challenged the bylaw itself. So the bylaw was created um, under the Calgary plan or the general plan, which was passed at the same time as the Planning Act came in, in 1963. In 1963, the Planning Act then required public consultation as part of your general plan. And well, there was none. It came in just right in the middle of the, of the creation of the Calgary plan, or of the general plan. So that the zoning bylaw was created under the general plan. So essentially, um, the abattoir went, uh, the bylaw was quashed, and so Calgary actually had no existing bylaw um, for six months. So from 69 to 70, for six months, they quickly uh, ran in and developed a, a land use bylaw, a zoning bylaw. But the effect is that anything pre-1970, March 16th, 1970, did not need a development permit. So as long as you had your building permit, then you're okay, you were legally built. But uh, effectively, anything pre-1970, we look at as you're pretty much grandfathered in. So that's my little cartoon on grandfather. Uh, look, someday you'll criticize the generation you raised, so just let me have my time. I think that's pretty, uh, pretty appropriate. So, one other aspect uh, that, uh, that Alberta was, was doing um, later, in, later on, fast forwarding to 2000, uh, the Minister uh, of uh, Municipal Affairs undertook to really define secondary suites in the codes. So in the building code, and in the fire code. These were not defined terms. So prior to uh, Alberta really um, showing some leadership actually uh, on the code development side, secondary suites did have to be built to essentially an apartment standard. It's a very high safety standard. It did not balance at all in terms of safety versus affordability. And there was a, a need to recognize that there were just, again, thousands of, uh, of existing illegal suites that had been constructed um, certainly uh, from that 1970 period on up to 2000. Uh, we've created this issue over decades, uh, but the, the, the result of the MLA Review Committee was to uh, uh, define secondary suites in both the building code and the fire code. So there's an upshot here, and that's all suites that were constructed on or before December 31st, 2006, only have to comply with the fire code. That's a really big deal when you're talking about older homes. So you don't need a second furnace, for example. Uh, you, the, the primary safety aspects that we're looking for are egress, emergency egress, that's your basement window, uh, the smoke alarms, and direct access to the outside. Those three pieces are really key when it comes to the fire code. Uh, the building code has a higher standard. Uh, you still need a smoke seal, and it's a smoke seal, not a, not a fire, uh, not fire separation. Again, the fire separation goes back to that duplex and, and to the apartment standard. Uh, but the, uh, the, the codes both recognized uh, the need for that, that emergency egress. And that starts to implicate these pre-1970 homes uh, in the city of Calgary because, as we'll see, uh, sorry, I want to talk about the incentive here. Um, so we, we discovered, okay, there's an incentive. We can actually create an opportunity for second, existing secondary suite owners to come forward, legalize their suite, and only comply with the fire code. It covers all of the safety aspects that we're concerned about, life safety aspects. Uh, the building code does get into uh, health issues as well, so it is a higher standard, but in terms of uh, basic life safety provisions, the fire code will suffice, and, uh, and a building official uh, can recognize the existing construction and, uh, and allow for um, some relaxation, I suppose, would be the term. So that was our first incentive. But when it comes to safety, you really can't, you can't grandfather safety. The fire code is retroactive. So the window sizes, the interconnected smoke detectors, uh, smoke alarms, I should say, um, and the direct access, those three things primarily, um, you, you can't grandfather those. So the fire code is retroactive meaning 
if you've got now a 1965 uh, grandfathered suite, you're okay as for the use, but now if you come in and you need to expand your window, uh, the legal non-conforming provisions of the MGA were kicking in. And those state that if you uh, do a structural alteration to your to a, uh, a legal non-conforming use, you lose that status. So that's a pretty strict interpretation of uh, of that of that provision. And really, we started to dig into the uh, to the case law of what uh, structural alteration and legal non-conforming and all of those things really mean. And uh, le the legal non-conforming status is uh, is is much more. Uh, robust actually so somebody has the right to continue that use for uh, for for you to lose that status you would actually have to um, increase the intensity of the use so increasing the size of the window yes it is absolutely a structural alteration but it does not increase the intensity of the legal non conforming it doesn't make it worse right you're just complying then with with a, with a basic safety provision so we were able to uh, to get a, a legal opinion on that and change our, our business model, really. Uh, so our development officers had previously gone out to a complaint on an older existing suite. Um, they, would not, they would have to essentially apply for a land use redesignation, then a development permit, and then a building permit. So that's quite a daunting process, so they would just shut it down, uh, all because of a window. So really through the case law, and through an, a different interpretation, essentially, of what legal non-conforming actually means and how you would actually have to lose it, we are able to, uh, to accommodate um, the, uh, the, the basic provision of, of windows so that uh, you, would, you would be able to come forward and not lose that, uh, that status. The second incentive that we did was we developed a, uh, a development permit exemption. So in most bylaws you have you know, a provision where things don't require a development permit. Um, all of our suites in the city of Calgary are either discretionary or permitted. Um, so where they were permitted, so now this kind of goes back a little bit to what, what can we do in the city of Calgary within the political reality, within the political context. And where they're existing, council's much more willing to have discussions about how to make the process better, how to make them safer. And, and, and really started to engage with us on uh, how can we move this forward. And the, uh, the development permit exemption was uh, a relatively small step, but it had major implications for uh, proponents of suites. It was one of the main reasons. So when we refer back to the, 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 the secondary suite pilot where we had building officials going out and looking at the safety aspects of suites, one of the main reasons people weren't coming forward was the process. So that includes the development permit. So where a suite was permitted, or, or is permitted, uh, we felt that we could actually define that and then exempt it in the, uh, uh, in the administrative provisions of the land use bylaw. So council was very supportive of that. And uh, we did create a uh, um, skip a secondary suite step. Uh, the director in charge of secondary suites thinks that that guy looks like he's falling to his death, but I, I think he looks really happy. So, the, the a pretty big impact, small thing, pretty big impact. Um, really, what this and this was our marketing, uh, marketing tool. So online, uh, we were going to uh, uh, a number of different uh, organizations to to drum this up, and uh, and see if we couldn't get people a bit more excited about uh, about applying for uh, a secondary suite if you could avoid some of these um, some of these process issues. So, the rules around it. Okay, so it has to be a permitted use. We, you can't exempt a discretionary use, right? That's a, that's a much different kind of animal. So they have to be permitted. The, you can't have any relaxations, which in, in effect actually results in a much more compliant suite, right? So if you know that if you make a few changes within your plans right there, right then and there, um, you're gonna comply with the rules of the bylaw, uh, as opposed to if you're already in the development permit process, to switch it from permitted to permitted with a relaxation is kind of a small thing. You're already in the process, so uh, we would find that people would go with a, with a relaxation. So there are no relaxations allowed if you want to be deep uh, development permit exempt. Uh, the backyard suites don't qualify, they're discretionary. Um, we do have one land use district uh, where uh, secondary suites, so again, basement suites, um, are discretionary, so they're, uh, they're, they're not part of the program either. 
um, and you can go straight to the straight to the building permit. So implementing it, we did a bylaw check, or we do a bylaw check at the counter. It's a it's a temporary development permit exemption. So we had to create a process that essentially took what was a 30-day development permit, and that's just you know that's the back and the forth, that's emails and phone calls and you know that that sort of customer interaction. So it just usually translated into uh, into a 30-day process. So now we're doing it at the counter, and we're and we're doing that in in less than a half hour. So it's it's a it's a wonderful benefit for the uh, for the applicant. They save a, a ton of time, obviously, and then there's costs that you don't have to incur. There's plans you don't have to create that sort of thing. Uh, we review for the for the building code after the bylaw check is done. In 100% of every single case, you have to have a, a building permit. That's one of the uh, one of the key pieces to to the safety aspect. Obviously, is getting that that building permit and getting all the inspections done. Um, we do find as we really dig into the into this sort of um, uh, uh, labyrinth of secondary suites, which is uh, it's fascinating to me. But as we really dig in, we find a lot of people that will apply for their building permit for the secondary suite, and they won't get that final inspection, right? So then it's just a it's just a a, a, a basement development. It's not a suite. If you don't get that final inspection, we don't know that you've complied with everything. Um, there's an interesting provision that you have the right to inspect, but you don't actually have the right to enter. So if somebody de denies you entry, even if you've got a building permit, you would need to toddle off and get a, and get a warrant from, to make that final inspection. So it becomes very laborious for a safety codes officer to, uh, to continue through that file. So we would close the file and you have a, a basement development, but you know, they've, they've gone through most of the process and it causes just enough just enough dust that it's hard to, to really pinpoint whether we could charge them or not. Um, the other thing that we did uh, to just create a bit more of incentive was we, we tinkered around the edges of the, of the bylaws, so some of the rules. Uh, we used to have a, a number of different ways that you would be permitted with a relaxation or discretionary or so many rules that really not one person would fully understand all of the rules. So we had to streamline them. We had lot area, lot width, uh, depth. Um, all of those three questions really got down to the, do you accommodate the parking stalls? That was really what those three questions were aimed at, so we got rid of those. Uh, the floor area, uh, they were limited to 70 square meters, and now within, uh, within the bylaw rule changes, if you're in the full basement, that's okay. Uh, if you go to a split level, kind of a sweet um, scenario, you're limited to 100 square meters. So a lot of our relaxations were focused on things that, you know, at the end of the day don't really matter. Um, if you're above 70 square meters, you would need a, a relaxation, right? So that became, um, didn't, didn't really lead us to a, to a positive outcome. Uh, provisions in the bylaw were fairly strict actually. There was even a statement in the bylaw that you could relax up to 10% of the 70 square meters, which I've never seen I've never seen for any other use actually. And that actually raises a legal question, can you relax that rule? Because you can relax any rule in the bylaw. So if you've got a rule that says you can relax 10, you know, 10 of the 70, <laughs> you could relax that rule too. But it causes a lot of confusion. So we got rid of, of the confusing part. So we got rid of the, uh, the size limitation, we got rid of the lot dimensions, uh, focused in on what people uh, tend to care about, which is parking, uh, from, a, from, a, uh, from a land use planning kind of perspective. Um, and we kept the minimum parcel width to seven and a half meters wide. So that's the smallest lot you can have in, a, in, a, in an R2, R1N, that sort of thing. Uh, the challenge is you need three parking stalls. So functionally, you need about 8.2 meters wide to actually fit all of your parking in there. Uh, however, I had a discussion with uh, uh, an investor of uh, secondary suites, and he was talking about putting in a lift in the garage as a legitimate way of having a relaxation. So we don't count, I think at Edmonton you, they do count uh, tandem parking. In Calgary we don't, um, but a lift in a garage, but that's pretty innovative. I'm surprised that he would uh, propose it, but you know, he's looking for relaxation on that third parking stall if he's got two in a garage with a lift. 
So that's kind of interesting. So we kept it at seven and a half meters so that we could, you know, essentially see what innovative uh, things people would come up with. And sure enough, somebody's already come up with one. So the development permit exemption saves 30 days. We've processed 140 um, in the last 13 months. So that's 4, 000, it's over 4,000 days of time saved for applicants. That's, that's incredible. It also saves city staff time. Uh, it's not as extreme, right? We're saving hundreds of hours, not, not thousands, uh, because even though it's a 30 day uh, over time kind of an approval, it's really just about five hours or so, three to five hours on average uh, for, the, for the file manager. So it does save us time, saves the applicant loads of time, um, and, uh, and, and obviously it's, a, it's an incentive for, for people to come in and, and, uh, and legalize. So we also uh, we updated all of our information on the, on the website to, uh, to again try and drum up the, uh, the, the interest in, in applying. The third incentive that, that we did, now we did need council approval for this, uh, January 1st, 2014, council waived the land use amendment and the development permit fees uh, for secondary suites, which um, as my, my colleague Ken Melanson, who, who is the administrative representative um, at these council public hearings, that has encouraged a lot of people uh, to come forward and apply for, uh, for a land use amendment. Um, a number of them, maybe a third or so, are existing illegal ones that have you know, decided to come forward or uh, they've been encouraged by somebody in a bylaw suit. Uh, coming forward to, uh, to to suggest that they might want to find time to legalize the suite. Uh, big savings in terms of dollars. It's a $5,000 application fee that was waived. Uh, so I think um, Ken and I were just chatting before uh, before the session, and I think at the next public hearing, there's some. It's it's over 20, somewhere between 20 and 25 individual land use applications, public hearings at the next council meeting. We've had as many as 30. 35, I think, 37 or something. It's it's arduous, and it makes uh, it makes council kind of grumpy. Um, but most definitely, the intention was to get people to to uh, come in and, and try to legalize their suite. They are they are doing it as intended. Um, it does result in, uh, in in a lot of bad press. It makes it makes the uh, the process uh, probably it's it's very lengthy, uh, but. At the end of the day, there is at least a path for people to, uh, to comply. The, uh, the development permit fee uh, was also waived. So for administration, it's, it's actually a double bonus having the development permit exemption. Since we were waiving the fee anyway, that's revenue that you know, we were losing, plus we were spending the time. So that's a double bonus for us uh, by waiving the, uh, the, the development permit. Um, an interesting thing that applies all throughout Alberta is um, a lawsuit again in Calgary uh, against the realtor for false advertising of a suite. Uh, they, there was a, a big payout. Um, the real estate industry has taken notice and their insurer, so RECA, R -E -C -A, uh, does require realtors to not list a suite for uh, like a granny suite or a nanny suite if it's not actually legal. So without that knowledge, without knowing that it's legal, you can't actually advertise the suite as being such. You can advertise it as illegal, which is interesting, but as long as they're up front, you know, hey, illegal suite, right, buyer beware. Uh, and we do see those, which then raises a different question for enforcement. If we see those, maybe we should pop out and have a, and have a look ourselves. Um, but in 2015, the effect is the Alberta Real Estate Association passed a provincial practice rule which restricted realtors from, uh, from participating in that practice. So that applies all across Alberta. And there was a lawsuit in uh, two, actually, in Ontario. Uh, the same results, right? Advertising a secondary suite as, uh, a, you know, a mortgage helper, that sort of thing. And, uh, and same, same end result of the, of the lawsuit there. So there was a real opportunity for us on that. And we took that, um, we didn't need council approval on this, but we took it forward as an information item. The registry is uh, free, it's voluntary, um, it does a few things. It's a, it's a map-based searchable tool 
Uh, you might have seen the, the, the PD map uh, tool. Uh, Calgary received uh, some, some accolades yesterday on it. So we're using this, this web-based tool uh, to essentially locate the secondary suites. We can, under the Safety Codes Act, you're very, very restricted in terms of what information you can display uh, publicly. You can display the building permit number, you can display the address and the date upon which it was completed. That's it. Much different than a development world, right, where we can display uh, a lot of different things. Uh, but the Safety Codes Act is actually more restrictive than, uh, than FOIP when it comes right down to it. So that's exactly what we do, though. We, we've got the address, we've got um, the date that it was completed, and we've got the building permit number. We also assign uh, an individual uh, sticker number. Um, we borrowed this idea uh, from New York City. Uh, they went through this as well, not for secondary suites. Um, I think they've got uh, a whole bunch of other issues, uh, but they also have um, safety within, within some of their dwelling units. So they've got lots of illegal dwelling units in New York. So they also have a sticker program. So we borrowed it from, uh, from, from our good friends in, in New York. So this sticker, we, we also made this um, open data. So we've got it listed on our, on our website. You can download the, uh, the table, and it's got all the addresses, and RentFaster uh, uses the sticker. So when they're advertising a secondary suite, uh, they use the sticker. The, the important part for us is that it makes it easy for a renter to ascertain whether or not the suite has permits. Now, you know, the word safe is a tricky one for a safety codes officer because you can't really guarantee something as safe. But it most definitely has all of the requirements, right? It meets the code. And so um, what that means is they've come in for a building permit, they've gotten all of their inspections because I referenced earlier that that's something that people will do is they will get their building permit and they will not complete the process. Um, sometimes knowingly, sometimes not. Uh, but, the, but, but at the end of the day, we need to verify that it's met all of the inspections. So once the suite has been fully inspected, and that's all of your other trade permits as well, so the trade permits go first and then the building, uh, the, the building inspector is the last one in essentially, they're essentially signing off on, um, on that final inspection. We mail out the sticker to the, uh, to the individual, it's voluntary. Uh, so we, we went through all of our um, existing suites for September 26th, we rolled this out. We tried to match it up with CMHC was having a big announcement on, they changed their rules of, uh, of the game as well, where you can now qualify for 100% of your, of your um, rental income can go towards your, your, your mortgage qualification. So that's a fairly big deal. So we tried to line it up with CMHC, but they, they didn't really have a big announcement, so it sort of fell flat a little bit. But uh, on September 26th, we did roll out with the, with the registry. We scoured all of our historical permits. In seven years, we had 431 um, legal, safe, secondary suites. That's not a huge number. Um, and, uh, and we really needed to point the needle in, in the right direction. So uh, currently, we've got 585. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a decent increase. Um, in one year, right? In 13 months, we've increased it by 35%. So we feel like with, with all of these different incentives, we've actually uh, turned the curve somewhat. And, uh, and we're now really starting to see um, a lot of people coming forward. We've got 130 that are issued, uh, building permits that are issued and under construction as well. So there's more to come. Not, uh, not everybody completes their process though, so we can't say 130 will be completed. So, uh, we, so we send out one, one really big success story, and I think that speaks to the registry. So we sent letters explaining what the registry is and with the sticker and said it's voluntary, you can opt out. So we were actually thinking, okay, we're gonna send out 431, maybe 100, right? Maybe 25% will opt out. We got zero. There, there wasn't a single person that opted out. We've taken three off the registry just because they were doing things they shouldn't be doing. Um, but ultimately, 431 went out, and 431 went onto the went onto the registry, even though it's voluntary. So putting your putting yourself out there in the in the public domain as having a secondary suite, we thought was going to be, you know, fall you know pretty flat with uh, with a lot of people. Yet it actually adds value, and that's a lot of it is from obviously the real estate side, 
um, a legal safe suite is worth a lot more uh, than an illegal suite. You can, you can generate your income, you can advertise it as such, um, and that's a, that's a big deal for, for those who are paying attention. Um, we've rebranded our, our entire website to help guide people on, on how to construct and get a legal safe suite. Um, the big questions are on code. So we have a technical advisory center uh, where you can call in and contact a, uh, usually it's on the building side, the electrical not so much and the plumbing not so much, but on the building side, absolutely. So again, with those new suites that are uh, January 1st, 2007 or newer, they have to comply with, with the building code, so the higher standard. So the, the, the two, uh, two sources of heat is, is the big one. Uh, but most definitely, uh, there's a lot of detail that, uh, that folks just aren't as uh, familiar with as they, uh, as they need to be. So we've got a lot of information on our, on our website, and that's definitely helping people uh, to decide for themselves, right? Because they need to understand what kind of costs they're in for uh, before they come in. Um, what we see with the, with the land use side is people aren't really, because it's free now, and so people aren't really doing the investigation on how much am I in for at the end of the day? Right, so we're seeing about a third of the people who are coming in for a land use application are actually making it through all the way to a building permit. So not necessarily a great return on all that time invested um, on, the, uh, on the public hearing side. However, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's at least information out there to help people make that decision before they, they start kicking some tires. So the good news, uh, we've got these four main incentives that, that, are, that are encouraging people to come forward. We're definitely seeing people uh, come forward that we never really thought they would. Out of our 280 um, building permits that have been issued in the last 13 months, uh, about a, it's over 100, it's about 110 or so, are existing illegal suites that have come forward. Uh, for us, that's a huge win uh, because we've been saying you know, now for, well, really since the, since the pilot ended in 2010, the suites are there, they're existing, they're, they're there and unsafe. We, we really need to do better as, as public officials to try and encourage these folks to, uh, to come in. So we're starting to see that. We are definitely pointing the needle in, in the right direction. Uh, we're not all the way there, so the good news is these four incentives are starting to turn the curve for us. The not so good news, when we get 30 plus suites at council, they get pretty unhappy, right? We, we start to look bad as an administration. We're, we're not doing enough to help council through this. Uh, this isn't, uh, it's not tenable long term. Um, we do need to strategize a, a better way for, uh, for the city to, to deal with issues in a, in a, on a grander scale. Um, however, within what we're allowed to do, there are certainly things that, uh, that we can. And so um, I'd leave you with, uh, don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. Um, even though we're not able to get all the way, um, and that's, that's, a, that's our goal. And we're definitely gonna continue to work on it uh, with council, with this council, with the next council, until we really sort out what is the best way for the city of Calgary forward um, overall. But until that time, we've got, uh, we've got some interesting programs that are really encouraging. Again, it's those existing illegal suites that there's just, there, there wasn't enough incentive prior to a lot of these, uh, a lot of these programs coming into place. Uh, so we feel like we're, we're starting to make uh, headway. And, uh, and also, with the registry, we'll be able to really dig into some of the details of, do they behave differently? Does a legal suite behave differently than um, a house? Just a regular house? Do they generate more complaints? We don't have that data. Uh, we did some guerrilla research on where we think the illegal ones are and we really don't see um, a difference between the two, how they function. Do they generate more complaints? And what are those complaints? So now that we've got a registry, we will be able to track that. Um, 13 months of data, uh, we don't really think that that's enough time to, uh, to, to you know, give us a clear picture, um, but over time we'll, we'll be able to do that. Uh, the development permit exemption ends on March 3rd, 2017, but we're going to be going to ask council to either extend that um, or just make it permanent. We, we really have, because it's a permitted use, the community 
didn't have a say anyway, right? So if an owner wanted a suite there on a permitted use, they, they would get it. Uh, so we don't see the value in this context of having uh, a permitted use development permit for a secondary suite. If you can bypass that and go straight to building permit, great. Might as well do that.